Thank you all for coming. It's lovely to be in Liverpool tonight, at the beginning of a heat wave, we're told, aren't we? I don't believe it in the northwest, but we'll see. Um, I haven't come too far because I'm just up the road at Lancaster University. Uh, I have um, just finished writing a book on the decline of the Church of England since Robert Runcie. It's called That Was the Church That Was, How the Church of England Lost the People of England. Uh, I mean, literally, I finished it at one o'clock last night, so I'm, <laughs> I'm very prepared to talk about this topic. Uh, I wrote that book um, with Andrew Brown, who has covered the Church of England for The Guardian for a lot, lot of his life. Uh, and between, we decided to do this book together because between us we lived through an awful lot of the events from Runtsey onwards. Andrew was there covering it as a journalist, so he was looking at the most newsworthy, uh, mostly London-based things. Uh, I was, I was, a, can you have a cradle Anglican? I was born and brought up in the Church of England in a village in rural Somerset and then I uh, taught in a theological college and then at various times I've been on the doctrine commission and on HE committees and uh, a vicar's wife uh, in the north of England for a bit. So between us, you know, I'm covered more like what's happening on the ground and he covered more what was happening at the, at the higher level. So between us we tried to try and make sense of what's gone wrong. There are plenty of chairs over here, sort of penitential wooden ones. <laughs> so that book is, is a diagnosis, and that's been quite hard to do. That book's tr been trying, we've been trying to work out what went wrong. I'm not going to spell out the evidence that something has gone wrong, because I think um, that has been quite well rehearsed uh, many of my colleagues in the sociology of religion have been counting for a long time uh, and when you, look, when you start counting over a long time in the Church of England all the graphs go down like this, they all sag and numbers fall and numbers fall whatever you're looking at whether it's church attendance or uh, baptisms, wedding, funerals or numbers of clergy or whatever it might be so that's the problem that we're addressing. Uh, it's one of partly numerical decline, but as the title says, it's also addressing the way in which the Church of England came adrift from people in England and from wider society. Now that probably all sounds very negative, but um, I'm going to, um, tonight, with you, and I hope with a lot of input from you, think about, well, what does it mean? Because my title isn't just about what went wrong, it's about what can be done. So I'll be looking at what went wrong, and every point I make about what went wrong has an implication for what might you then need to do uh, to um, recover or recreate. So I'll be looking at the positive as well as the negative tonight. Um, so I have a simple uh, structure for this talk. I'm going to talk about four things, not like a sermon with three, four things I think, which I think on balance are the major things that went wrong. And in relation to each one, I'll look at what it means about um, where the church needs to go now. First of all then, in my diagnosis, part of the problem that the Church of England faces is a problem that isn't unique to it. It's a problem that all national state churches with their origins in the Reformation and the creation of the modern nation states uh, face. Uh, it's a problem that the Nordic churches face, we have somebody here who, uh, who, who's doing that, the Nordic churches are the nearest comparisons to the Church of England, the Church of Norway and Denmark and Sweden, for example, founded at similar times as part of a nation-building process. Now, all these churches have seen quite similar declines in attendance. Um, the Nordic churches are down to even lower attendance rates, slightly lower. So it's not that the Church of England, and there were things that Church of England 
was going to face. It couldn't really avoid. It's not that it did something wrong in this regard. It's a problem faced by nationalised forms of religion. Um, one little proviso, the Nordic churches are doing much better on, uh, on other indices. So the, so the Nordic churches have very big ma Christian majorities, i.e. people who say on things like censuses that they are Christian, or Church of Norway, or Church of Denmark. It's predicted, there's a very, there are very good predictions for religion that have been published by the Pew Research Foundation in the USA recently. They predict to 2050, all the Nordic churches are going to retain very large Christian majorities of 60-70%. Um, and those people in those countries are also paying church taxes, so they're keeping the churches afloat. So they're doing better in terms of, in terms of identification. Church of England has only a third of people are now identifying, and it's fewer with every generation. So it's predicted to lose, Britain is going to lose its Christian majority. So the Church of England is doing worse on affiliation. It's also doing much worse on the occasional offices of uh, baptism, marriage, weddings, confirmations, which are all holding up better in Scandinavia. So that's interesting. But on attendance, it's facing something similar. They've come apart from their people uh, in some similar ways. Why? Well, it's about the nature of Englishness itself. The Church of England did, survived and did well when it um, uh, held up a kind of mirror, if you like, of the better image of the nation. Um, uh, first of all, of course, England uh, and imposing uniformity on England, and then Britain. That was to do with the, the British Empire and the way in which the Church of England uh, was able to um, legitimise in some ways and benefit from uh, Britain's imperial ethos and culture, and bound up with a sense of, of the greatness of the British, the English people, and of their Protestant religion. Now, that means that the collapse of that kind of English-British identity, along with the collapse of empire, um, has been very um, corrosive of the Church of England. England now has a crisis of identity. The Church of England suffers from that. England now is much more, much more diverse culturally, religiously, than it was in the past. So the Church of England can't hope to say it represents English values and English culture anymore. Can't possibly do that. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem not of its own making that it has to face. Uh, but it will never again be able to be the, you know, the uh, in its own mind. Of course, there are always nonconformists uh, and Catholics, but it can't be the national church in the way it once was. And it needs to um, um, divest itself of its imperial pomp and pomposity and pretensions quite quickly. But um, one little element to that as well, I think the, the Church of England survived in the 50s, 60s, 70s because it was able to move from an imperial church to the Church of Welfare post-war Britain. The Church of England had a brief period of flourishing because it threw in its lot with the creation of a big welfare state. So did the Nordic churches, part of their success as well. And it's no coincidence that those northern European countries have big welfare states it's tied up with having uh, churches that have Lutheran origins and worked with the state to produce national welfare states. Our welfare Britain, post-war Britain, it shrunk from being imperialistic, but it was very nationalistic. If you remember, the welfare pro project was about having things like a health service that would be the envy of the world. So there was still a lot of national ambition and pride in the post-war welfare utopian vision of what it was to be British. Okay, we haven't got an empire anymore, but we're going to have the fairest society, you know, the best health provision, all those sorts of elements of pride. And the Church of England helped to build the welfare state. The Church of England donated its hospitals and its schools and various workers. It made possible the welfare state. So that gave it um, a boost in the, the post-imperial period, but then that kind of turned against it 
because the welfare state and uh, its professionals gradually secularised and forgot about the church's role and didn't really need the church. And in fact, a lot of um, um, uh, social service providers and professionals wanted to move to a secular professional ethos and identity and get rid of the more amateur, clerical um, and volunteer um, kind of uh, Christian elements. And that's left the Church of England, not really knowing what it is. It still does, it still wants to be, I think it's in its mindset, particularly if, you know, when you look at Church House and things in London, it wants to be a really big grand imperial church. It's got its civil servants, it's got its pomp and circumstance, it's got its bishops in the House of Lords. But those, those are pretensions beyond what it really is these days, and it's all looking a bit flimsy, and no one really listens or cares when the church makes great social pronouncements anymore. It needs to come to terms with that, not, not cling on to it. Uh, someone described the Church of England as like, as like an alcoholic. You know, it's still clinging on to its drink, its pomp, and it needs to admit there's a problem and let go of that, the pomp and the prestige and admit that it's only one church amongst others and one religion amongst others and that no religion is the growing identity of young people, not Christian at all. And it has to realise that and engage with that. Okay, but what's the good news in my decline of nationalised religion, first point? What's the good news in that? Well, there's a challenge to the Church of England to be able to support, recover, um, cherish aspects of English culture which people do still hold dear. If you survey Anglicans in this country, which I do a lot, who are they? Anglicans are um, um, slightly likely to vote, they're more likely to vote Tory. They're slightly right-wing, you know, slightly more right-wing than general population. Um, they come from different classes, but they're quite middle class. They're daily mail readers. Uh, they're daily telegraph readers. Okay, clergy don't like to hear this, but it's true. They shop in Waitrose. Uh, those people... Um, are, David Cameron is typical. You know, he is a proud member of the Church of England. Uh, what he says about his faith, it comes and goes, and the values he believes in, that's the kind of Englishness that actually the Church of England needs to re-engage with. Re-engage doesn't mean you're uncritical. You can, you can um, uh, be as critical as you like, but you have to recognise that's what people value about the Church of England. Those elements of Englishness that they think really matter. Local history, family history. Um, um, David Cameron says the prayer book. I'm not sure that's true, but, but certainly, you know, the, the, the contribution of the Church of England to our culture and our language, local festivals, local customs, virtues and values like decency, fairness, not taking yourself too seriously. I mean, all sorts of things come from a bound up with the Church of England, and the Church of England could make a good fist of um, supporting some of those things and turning them to good value. Um, uh, Mary Berry, you know, the great British Bake Off. This is, this, is, this is natural territory for the Church of England. Flowers, cakes, fates, <laughs> local community. It's great, nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful. People value, young people value and cherish it. My students the other day said, Oh, our local vicar invited us to tea at the vicarage, and they were really excited. <laughs> that, that is now, you know, that might have seemed awful for two generations ago. For this generation, that's really great. Um, so there, there's a lot to be recovered, not jettisoned there. Don't diss every element of Englishness. Secondly, secondly, what went wrong? What went wrong was the Church of England became more and more and more clerical. In fact, we think the Church of England has become more clerical today than it ever was in the past. 
Uh, if you look at a church like this, I was just talking to Guy about it, it was built by lay people, sponsored by lay people. Uh, an awful lot of churches right around the country were owned by lay people, by lay patrons, big landowners, um, people who clubbed together like this. Laity and clergy were in partnership, or laity were in control. The, church, the head of the Church of England is a laywoman, H.M. the Queen. Um, the Church of England until the 70s was controlled by Parliament. It was a lay-run church. Parliament controlled the Church of England on behalf of the people of England. Now, all the, the clergy have been getting rid of all those things so that they are in almost sole control. The deal with Parliament was put in a synod, you know, give people a bit more control. Uh, if you look back to the debates about synod, a lot of people quite rightly said it should be one person, one vote. If you're on the electoral roll, you get a vote. The bishops blocked that. They didn't trust people. They didn't want people to have a vote. They made it so it's got three houses. The bishops get a third. Think how fair this is if you're representing the Church of England. Bishops get a third. They're all there. Clergy get a third. Lay people, the whole of the laity, get a third. And you have to get a two-thirds majority in each of those. Well, you can imagine what's going to happen. And the way it's set up, it means that um, activists can and have um, dominated in the House of Laity. So it doesn't actually represent the views of the majority of Anglicans. So you get policies and votes that are a mile away from what ordinary Anglicans think. You know, for example, on women, clergy and bishops, Anglicans were in favour um, when polls started being taken in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it's taken till two years ago <laughs> for Synod to get to that point. Um, similarly, on gay marriage, Anglicans are now in favour. Who knows how long it's going to take for the church as a whole to get to that point. So, um, clerical domination of decision making, of policy, clergy also being increasingly cut off from any kind of lay control. For a long time that's meant, but it still does really, that at the higher leadership it's been very, very masculine dominated. Um, women clergy are still um, concentrated in unpaid posts and less prestigious posts. Of course, the women bishops thing is going to change that. Um, but for a long time, there have been sort of three, four, five generations, four, three, of highly educated professional women um, who have not been able to go into the church in a, in a way that would use their talents. Um, a huge loss, given that women have been the most supportive of the Church of England and the most numerous historically. Uh, losing all that talent. Uh, has been bad. And of course, if you have any all-male group, they're going to be half as good as a mixed group because they're not competing against the real talent. Uh, and I think you can probably see that. <laughs> uh, Another thing that, this is very unpopular to say this, as you can tell, as you can probably imagine, I am unpopular with the bishops. Another thing in this clericalisation, um, another bad thing that happened um, in the post-war period was you got, a, you got the clergy voting for more and more privileges and finance for themselves on equal terms. This is really important. Um, so, as I was saying before, if you look at a church like this, it was controlled by the local people and they would compete for the best vicar. You know, they'd offer great terms and a big salary. This would have been a very big, posh, rich church. They'd have got, they did get a kind of, you know, superstar clergyman, like guy, in here <laughs> <laughs> to run things. Um, he would have been paid, I don't know, how many times, do you know his salary? 10 times, 20 times, 30 times as much as someone who wasn't a good preacher in a little parish somewhere else. There was an internal market. There still is in the Episcopal Church in other countries like the um, United States, for example. Um, now, um, the differentials were partly to do with the size of your living. You know, if you had a, some parishes produced a lot of money, they had a lot of land um, or other things. 
Uh, now, what happened in the enthusiasm of immediate post-war period, when everyone was being more egalitarian, um, it was thought it would be a good thing for the clergy to equalise, to peg in the same way. They'd all have the same. Do so you remember that's when big vicarages got sold off, clergy all got the same sort of size, four or five bedroom house, poor things, and I lived in one once, it was lovely, and um, the, the stipends, clergy don't have salaries because they're employed by God, the stipends were, were more or less equalised unless you were a bishop. And more or less that, and the pensions, and more or less that has continued. Now, when Synod was created in the 70s, some, its first acts were to keep voting more and more money for the clergy. Not surprisingly, it could because it dominated Synod. So salaries, stipends were pegged to that of teachers. They went up every year in the 70s. Uh, the pension got bigger and bigger, so it came two-thirds. It still is two-thirds of clergy stipends. Um, more and more people were put into the pension thing. There was no kind of limit on it. And it was all fine because the church commissioners were making loads of money out of property development until 1991 and the recession, so they could pay for it. But actually, they were having to borrow more and more and more, and that's why they had a kind of crisis in the early 90s. They couldn't keep paying for all these clergy. <coughs> now, today, if you look at the clergy... I can say this because I was a vicar's wife. If you, if you look at the clergy whole package, house... Um, expenses, um, no taxes, I mean, not, not council tax, um, tax breaks, blah, 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 um, stipend. Depending on where you live, because houses are worth much more in the southeast, it's, the whole package is worth something like between 75 to 100,000. So clergy are amongst the best paid professionals, more than professors, in the country. Now, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, they're highly skilled professionals, but the idea that you can go on having more and more, they're extremely precious and expensive resources, which have to be spread thinly. Um, and what was partly bad about this isn't just that then the funding thing starts to wag the tail of the church, because you have an enormous salaries and pensions, sorry, stipends and pensions bill to, to uh, support, um, so getting money starts driving everything, um, but also you get a disjunction, all, of, all the facts I've been talking about means you get a bit of a disjunction between clergy and lay people, because clergy don't live in the real world. They're not subject to the same pressures, they don't understand how poor most people really are, who are actually living on the same salary, average salary, but without a free house, a free car, having to travel to work. And yet clergy feel poor. So it creates a really bad mindset. Um, and in some ways, they're right. I mean, some of the things about it, like your house having to be a public a public space, people being able to call you up at any time and expect things from you, all those things are extremely difficult to negotiate. So everyone agrees there's something broken in that model. And of course it, it also doesn't allow any sort of serious competition, so someone straight out of theological college or someone who's hopeless gets paid the same as someone who's great. There's no reward, there's no penalty. What's the positive in this? Well, the positive is there's an enormous amount of money that can be saved quite easily. Um, an easy and sensible way to save it is to have non-stipendiary clergy. This was a, a, a great experiment, which has been quite successful, but for some reason, Central Church has kind of given up on it. And... Uh, and Self-supporting ministers, as they prefer quite rightly to call themselves, because they are paying their own salaries and working for the church, have been treated as second-class clergy. Uh, absolutely wrong. Um, in fact, they're much better connected with the stresses and strains of most people's lives, because they're in normal kinds of jobs. So, support, seeing that as a, actually the most desirable form of ministry, keeping... Um, fully stipendiary ministers for very particular jobs where they need to be released from the pressures and thinking clearly about that, but not treating them as better than the ones who are working, 
rebalancing, that could be an enormously easy win. Also, positively, um, what needs to happen against the whole clericalisation of the church is proper partnership with the laity. Again, not something the church is even yet prepared to consider. The church's recent plans have about one paragraph on the laity, and they say, well, put aside money for training them. Well, a lot of us don't need training. <laughs> We're actually quite well trained as it, as it is. We've been training for decades. Uh, and we have skills that would be great, very useful to the church, but it doesn't ask, it doesn't value them, it doesn't use them. Proper partnership with the laity, again, is a huge untapped source of rejuvenation that can be used. Thirdly, and I'm going to be quicker on my last two so we can have a good time to talk. Thirdly, what went wrong? Division. Well, at, well and hypocrisy. That's my heading, cheery heading. Division and hypocrisy. A, 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 a state church, a national church, is necessarily a broad church. The Church of England has always, thank goodness, been a broad church. It has always included a huge spectrum of theology, of liturgical preference, of beliefs and values. Fantastic opportunity, actually. But why, is, why has it been, given that wonderful starting point, remember where I started this talk, a more diverse Britain? Well, a broad church in a great position to be diverse and to match the diversity of society and cities and so on. But it hasn't. Why not? Well, because the way it coped with its breadth and diversity in the past was mainly through a don't ask, don't tell policy, especially when it came to conflicting moral values. Take homosexuality. Everyone has always known that the clergy are not just as likely as ordinary people to be gay, but more likely than ordinary people to be gay. Everyone has always known that. Old ladies knew that about their vicar, even though no one talked about it. And it kind of worked when society itself was like that. Well, society's not like that now. It's quite a recent change, but society now values openness. In fact, our legislation demands it. Things under the Blair government, like data protection, freedom of information, are all about transparency and openness of public bodies. And in our value system, we value openness, we hate hypocrisy and lying. The Church of England came to a Rubicon in the 80s. Um, some of you will remember this. June Osborne was writing a on, on the gay issue. June Osborne uh, was writing a report um, about the whole issue of homosexuality in the church. She did exactly what's doing, happening now, listening to lots of people, gay and straight, writing a very thoughtful and open report, which would encourage greater diver allowing diversity on the issue. Uh, if you think back, the church had actually, it had got there more or less on women. The church got there on women by allowing diversity. It allowed the people who conscientiously thought women shouldn't be priests to coexist along with those who thought they should. Great, that's what I think the church should be doing. It should allow people to um, live according to their own integrity. So it sort of managed that with women, but when it came to gay people, that was what June Osborne was proposing in the, 18, eight, in the 80s, 1980s. She was derailed by um, Tony Higton, if you can think back to those, in, in 87, uh, who stood up in synod and said, we all condemn homosexuals, don't we? And there was a sort of long silence, and everyone in synod agreed that they did. And that was a disaster, because it's not proved possible to row back from that big lie. Even the House of Bishops, who have put out more statements since then, saying that clergy can be gay, but not practice, and not be in partnerships, and not marry. Even the bishops, everyone knows some of those bishops are themselves gay and in partnerships. So it's a, it's a big hypocrisy. The church has, and once you start getting into a culture of dishonesty these days, you're in real trouble because people aren't stupid and people pick up on that. 
And there is a culture of dishonesty now in the Church of England at the highest levels, uh, and it, it stinks, to be honest, not just on that issue, but on others. Not liking the truth, attacking people who tell the truth, having a comms department that is more puts out proper, positive propaganda sometimes for the church. Churches should be about truth. The truth sets us free. This isn't, isn't attractive to anybody. So what's the good news? Uh, the church still is a broad church. If it could embrace its diversity, it could thrive. My proposal is a franchise church, a bit like Starbucks. I think the Church of England, I've written a thing about this, I think there are five franchises in the Church of England. One of them is Inclusive Church, so that's the one guy I would belong to, <laughs> given your notice outside. Uh, there's Inclusive Church, there's a Social Justice Church, there's uh, Forward in Faith Biblical Conservative Church, there's a Holy Trinity Brompton franchise. It's already a franchise, it's doing really well, a charismatic evangelical franchise. There's the Heart of England franchise, um, and there's the Cathedrals and Choral franchise. That's my, that's my fantasy. <laughs> Just like Holy Trinity, each one should say, this is who we are, this is what we stand for, uh, let's go for it. Because it's a, it's a myth that the church is one big happy family that can be unified. If the family could split so that each bit could do its own thing happily, with integrity, it could flourish. All that energy and lying would stop. That's my, that's my, that's my hope. Fourthly, finally, what went wrong? Um, what was being offered at the local level? The things that most people actually face, where the church interfaces with most people, Sunday morning worship, the occasional offices, things like that, are just not good enough in too many cases. That's a very appropriate starting up of the... <laughs> it's, it's, good mood, it's good mood music. It's absolutely fine. I like it. It's good for what I'm saying here. Um, uh, worship on a Sunday morning. It's not a timeless thing. The kind of work parish communion we have was only universally adopted in the 50s. It was, comes from the 20s. It's about unified welfare Britain. One size fits all. Well, it doesn't fit anymore. There should be room for much more diversity. Um, the occasional offices. They're not done as well. They are sometimes, but consistently they're not done as well as alternative providers can do. Funerals are collapsing because so-called secular celebrants, and they're not secular at all these days, they're just very professional and they'll do, they'll do things in partnership with people, do a better job on the whole. More professionally know what you're getting. All those things have to be put right. They're, if the church isn't bringing people into life giving connection with truth, with God, at those key points, of course it can't flourish. And that needs a really thoughtful reorganisation so that the right people are doing those sorts of jobs, so that worship is more varied and appropriate to today's world and more diverse depending on your different franchise um, and so on. Finally, you might be sitting there thinking, That's all, this is all very well, but who's going to raise the money? Well, like I said, you need to start cutting first. There's no proposals for cutting. Cutting is essential, and uh, at this stage, there's so much fat, it won't hurt too much. But more than that, money has got... Some, the church has got into this mindset that it can only raise money through the Sunday morning collection, so it only cares about people who go to church regularly on a Sunday, and it try, it's trying to convert everyone else to be regular Sunday morning worshippers. Most members of the Church of England have never gone to church regularly on a Sunday morning, and they certainly don't today, but they still feel a commitment to the church and might well pay some money to the church. So again, imagination, how can you re-engage the majority of Anglicans who don't want to go to church on a Sunday morning? And fewer and fewer people do. So I'm going to leave with, I'm not going to answer that now, but I'm going to leave with one thought. Um, last year, I 
together with um, Martin Percy in Oxford, organised a series of debates about the future of the Church of England. And we looked at various topics like money, people, vision and so on. And we got four speakers to come and talk about each. And to, for me, my favourite, the standout talk for me was by, it was on buildings and money. And it was by Fiona Ren Dame Fiona Reynolds, who turned the National Trust round from being uh, uh, um, a not so successful organisation to being an incredibly successful membership organisation. Some people say, oh, membership organisations aren't popular at all. It's not true. Depends on the type. National Trust, I can't remember how many million members it has. It's an extraordinarily successful membership organisation that's grown and grown. How did she do it? So she started this talk. There was, so there was, it was quite funny because there were clergy talking about mothballing their buildings and so on. So she started her talk and she said, when I took over the National Trust, it was a bit like the Church of England. Everyone said, it's got all these liabilities. It's got these huge old houses that cost a fortune to keep and that are all decaying and they've all got dry rot and um, all this land and how on earth is it going to survive? And she said, and I thought you're completely wrong because actually, people today aren't motivated by money and self-interest. They're motivated by beauty and other people and history. And we had that in spades. And all I had to do was connect people with these places and buildings, and it was all going to be fine. And she said to the clergy, you are crazy to be talking about mothballing these wonderful buildings that people love. Forget the not wonderful people, but old, wonderful concrete churches, get rid of them. But the ones that you're talking about are a fantastic asset, but you've got to think about how to reconnect people with them in ways that are real and life-giving and don't necessarily involve clergy. And imagine being a Church of England like the National Trust. You pay your £80 membership fee every year. You don't necessarily go at all. You get a card. If you want to go, you can. Just think, you know, a third of the, a third of the population is still C of E. You'd solve the money problems overnight. So that might not be the answer, but it just shows how you can. There are other ways of raising the money problem. And it shouldn't be, the money shouldn't be the thing that is driving the future of the church. The church has to flourish in its own right and the money follows from where the spirit is. I'm going to stop there so that I can get your uh, criticisms, uh, thoughts and reactions and questions. Thank you. And Guy's going to be the chair, I think. I hope. I'll throw a point at people. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. And Jonathan's going to do a full vote of thanks when we finish tonight. But um, perhaps just um, take two minutes just to turn to a neighbour and uh, if you have a thought or got a question sort of forming in your mind just just a little bit of conversation where where we are just for a couple of minutes i just put you all in one of the things that we try to do on a sunday morning at sobriety is to give people a chance to talk to each other um, as, as well as hearing from the front so i hope you've had a little chance to uh, to, to do that, but let's um, let's hear some voices uh, from the floor. I don't know whether anyone's got questions about uh, the kind of cake Jesus might have baked and what recipe we might use if we're going to switch to tea and cake for communion. Uh, pondering that. <laughs> but, um, uh, let's start with that, Trevor. I just want to ask if you've got any comments about the two negative aspects on the church of England. What is the media and always having a go? And also the effect of the soaps, in which the religious characters are always negative, not really nice people, and how that affects the psychology of people's affection to the church. And then there's um, this aggressive atheism, mm -hmm. where people are being made to feel stupid if they believe. Mm. And how, uh, you know, because the mm. church has a kind of really. That. Yes. And just allow it to wash over yes. Yes. Very good points of, of making a, a more difficult climate to flourish in, um, but I think that's only half the story. Um, 
because the media also do good things for the church, or potentially do. So if you look at all the, you know, um, poofter in the pulpit type stories, um, that was hypocrisy. If there hadn't been hypocrisy, the church had been open about, we have some gay people, we don't, there would have been no story. So the church played that one, because newspapers love, everyone loves exposing hypocrisy. So the church has given it that as a gift for decades. <laughs> um, um, but actually, another way of looking at the tabloid approach to the church is it kind of, well, it used to, it still cared. It still had an ideal that the church should be a good thing and mattered. It'd be much worse if it wasn't saying anything at all about the church. I think it's nearer to that now, which is worse. It just lost interest. Uh, some soaps have had positive clergy figures. Um, EastEnders did once, didn't it? And... Um, uh, uh, they're not always vicious dragons, and of course the Vicar of Dibley was a very positive kind of popular culture um, model. Um, the new atheism is actually not very successful. I wouldn't worry too much about it. The Richard, if you look at how many people share Richard Dawkins' views, it's very small, even amongst young people, about 5%. Um, those ideas are not popular. In fact, younger people, my students now, are... Um, very clear that they're not anti-religion like Dawkins. I think that's gone out of fashion. But what hasn't gone out of fashion, which is a real challenge to the church, is the Dawkins view of how the world came to be, which has become the kind of default way of understanding cosmology. And there, the church has a huge challenge, which is kind of ducked, of explaining how it believes God, what God is like and how God brought the world into being. Uh, and I think it's evaded for decades, really taking seriously the challenge of what evolution means for how we think about God and God's action in the world. And it just hasn't tried to give a really good response to Dawkins' most fundamental points. So there's another challenge there. <laughs> now, sometimes the Church of England is seen by many as somehow remote, uh, in the way that, for instance, the Salvation Army isn't. Do you think perhaps the Church of England might do better to be a little bit more like the Salvation Army? And talking about buildings, now I lived in Walton for a time, opposite St Mary's in Walton, and uh, I was in a high-rise flat, and in the night, True, and people love buildings, people love them, uh, and so they shouldn't be seen as a liability, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there should be a kind of proper audit, some need to go, so the ones that people don't love, or where the population's moved, or where they're not attractive, but after that, they need, they need to be rejuvenated and people need to use them for various things and love them again. Um, uh, and um, yes, I do think that the church needs to re-engage with people where they are. Um, there are lots of bits of the church that already do that. It's schools do that. Um, chaplains do that. I think chaplains are a really ready-made, wonderful way of the church moving forward. So they're not in a church building necessarily. You know, they're right there in the school, in the workplace, in the prison or whatever it might be, uh, working with people in the university. And interestingly, it's, it's, it's a growing area of demand. So in some new schools, for example, some new academies, they're employing chaplains even when they're not Church of England. They see the value of having a chaplain and what it can do for an institution. So I think, I think that's a really exciting uh, area to expand into. So I need to disguise I'm clergy, for those who don't know me. Um, I was just interested when you were talking about the way the clergy came in call. Now, for me, one of the strengths of that was the way 
And the way the church paper was and still is committed to providing clergy in areas that are desperately poor. And in areas like, for example, my area, which is the Deaf Church, which will never, mm -hmm. on any market, if they had been left it to market forces, there will be no chaplains amongst deaf people in the deaf community. And so for me, one of the long term questions of the Church of England that I'm just looking for an answer for, so I'm just throwing it out here, really, <laughs> is how can we remain committed? So for me, the, one of the key values of the Church of England is the way they are committed to staying in areas, mm. whether they're poor, whether they're rich, to cover the whole country. So, any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, no, well, I agree with you, and so I think you, you wouldn't have a complete free market you would have to have, like we do in this country, you know, a, a moderated free market so there would be some sensible way of looking at areas which need to have clergy provision which can't afford it uh, because that fits with the vision of what a good Church of England should be. So uh, the examples that you gave, keeping clergy in areas where other people aren't there, where that's important, where it really is important, um, or for groups, parts of the population that couldn't afford it, yes. Fine, absolutely. You have to protect. You have to protect that part. So I'm not talking about a complete and utter free market. It needs some moderation. Um, what do you think the ecumenical and full communion partners, both national and confessional, could contribute to this discussion, especially in areas like affiliation and uh, what we call tent making ministry? which is self-supporting uh, ministry. So I think you call it self-supporting Yes, uh -huh. yeah, we call it tent-making ministry. <laughs> I'm going to ask you that question because I think you've got <coughs> probably more interesting answer than me uh, because you do it. Um, but um, let me just make a... I'm going to make a high-level comment and I'd like to hear from you about what can happen at local level. Um, but... Generally speaking, ecumenism, I don't think, has been played out fairly by the church authorities of the Church of England. So they have treated some churches as more important than other ones. So, for example, the Paul Vu agreement with the Lutheran churches means that the Church of England is in full communion with the Lutheran churches. They're its nearest cousins. Uh, and yet it has not, it's not listened to them, it's not taken their views seriously, it's not learnt from them. It's always treated more conservative churches and parts of churches as the really important ones that we need to listen and dialogue with and often literally not put the right mixture of people around the table. Uh, so I think that's been a disaster and it could have learnt a lot. They could have learnt a lot from each other. But at local level, how do you think that, that can work out positively? Um, well, in my church, most pastors are intended to making ministry. There's only one or two who are actually paid by their congregation. So we all have jobs um, that can be exciting because you are not financially dependent on your congregation. So if there's a, a possible conflict, well, it can be resolved without the money aspect. Right. Um, but it's also stressful because you are not 24-7 available for your parishioners. Yeah. Um, now, my congregation lives very widespread, so they won't even expect that of me. Um, but in congregations that live a bit closer to each other, that might possibly be a problem. Um, and also, mm. I think that the tent-making ministry only works if there's a good network of information. Yes. Especially within the congregation yes. locally. I have a friend who has a friend who knows of a job or a place to stay or to live. Because most of our buildings are rented as well. So we don't Interesting. Our churches interesting. Yes, thank you. That's very interesting. So um, you're referring to Paul tent making. So there was a reason why Paul said that clergy should keep their own jobs um, and not be dependent on congregations, wasn't there? Um, and... Um, uh, I think that if you treat some clergy need I think being a 
an ordained clergy person, in some, say, some, some, sense, some cases, is an occupation. Uh, it's quite right that some people need to have the resources and be paid fully, to be fully occupied with, with God, with worship, with chap- whatever it might be. There are lots of cases where that's so, um, but there are some where that's not so. So if you take what's happening in rural areas where you're getting not one you're getting more and more united benefices so clergy have to run around increasing numbers of churches it's getting to the point where you're going to have to have lay people doing more and actually that might be good uh, and that might be quite transformative and you don't actually need a full-time paid clergy person in every one of those churches so it's a mixed picture and it needs to be carefully thought through where you do and where you don't need that What's the opposite of tent making? Um, <laughs> tent given, I don't know, kind of ministry. Um, David, um, does the transfer of money to the sounds great? And you're right, moderation. Um, the point about a communion is that people will take communion with each other. Yeah. And the different branches of the franchise, well, there's a lot of conservatives who don't walk into a liberal church and take communion there. And the question would be if the different bits, the different franchises won't take communion with each other, have you got a communion? Yes. Is it viable? Yes. Good, very good question, a very hard question. So, so really you're saying, um, where's the boundary? You know, will we let everything in? You can have any franchise, or should the Church of England, has it got to have some boundaries? Uh, like, if you won't take communion with other members of the Church of England? Uh, or where would you put the boundary? Um, I think there has to be some. I think the boundary has to be if you are deliberately being fifth columnist, if you're deliberately trying to take over and destroy other legitimate parts of the church, I think that's a boundary and that people haven't been strong enough in saying that's not acceptable. Um, but beyond that, I would, I would be tolerant. So you're saying if there's goodwill and respect between the different franchises? And yes, and they behave decently. Yeah. I think that's the that bottom line. You have to behave decently. You Once you start bullying, trying to covertly destroy lying, you're not behaving decently. You need minimal decency to be part of this organisation. Somehow it's slipped that there's no bottom line anymore. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> you're not I, <laughs> oh, you're neglecting. You're neglecting the, the left wing or the right wing. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Working around. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, in my depressed moments, I think, well, I'm not sure which is the worst thing, the Church of England or the Labour Party. And they're both in a similar Very mess. similar, very similar. <laughs> and I know you said that most... Anglicans probably vote Tory, but that's, that's irrelevant, I think. Mm. Labour Party, you've got three out of four candidates for uh, leader actually virtually uh, turning the back on what the party exists for. Uh, in other words, they're seeing it, it simply exists to get voted into power uh, and they'll adopt any uh, policies that will get them, get them there. The Church of England seems to be running around like a headless chicken, trying to, you know, get bums on pews, get, as you say, get the money coming in, do this, do that, do the other. Um, just keep, keep alive. And, and you've given some sort of um, suggestions as to how that might be addressed. But I'm not sure that you've addressed the core issue, which is, well, what is the Church for? You know, what's our vision? What's our... I come, you know, what are we focused on? And I think if, we, if we've lost that, we've lost everything. Well, um, it, it certainly isn't about cream teas and pickering salmon. Of course, sandwiches, it, you know? it, it, of course it has to inspire, it has to bring people into life giving connection with God. It has to. Yeah. But I think the wrong, I think, I think it's a great parallel, the Labour Party and the Church of England. And actually, I think. It is a tempting mistake to think, let's have a vision statement. You know, here are our basic visions and we're going to rally around them. Okay, that's what's going wrong with the Labour Party. It's more concerned about party vision than actually listening to what electors are saying. Because there aren't any visions. 
There are, in old Labour, people are saying, let's go back to our core values. Well, yeah, but they're not. Yeah, but the voters don't want those core values. So the vote, you've got to listen to the voters. You've got to listen to the people uh, who might you come know, to church. Transferring the analogy, if, if the majority of the population of this country said, we quite like the Church of England, but we don't, we're not bothered about all this God business, or we don't, you know, we, we don't think the Bible's important, or whatever. No, that's a, that's, no, no, you're no. going to a, a ridiculous extreme. It's a dialogue. It's a dialogue between your history, your beliefs, your values, and people today. And people today aren't stupid. They have really interesting things to say about politics and about the church. And if you engage your tradition with people, you end up in a better place. You move forward. Neither the church nor the Labour Party are moving forward. They're both looking backwards at the moment and being incredibly defensive. It's not new Labour. Oh, it, it can't be this. It's too liberal. It's not... It's not moving forward. So I agree with you, you've got to have a vision moving forward, but it's got to be in really open dialogue with your voters or church members. Okay. You've got to listen to them. Yeah. Yeah, I but don't abandon all your principles. I'm not just saying go with a focus group. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> They're false extremes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Several hands on this side of the room. Who's had their hand the longest on this? <laughs> yes, that poor lady there is absolutely desperate now. You've neglected her for so long. Just on the flip side of clergy being in position, so in a in paid position, what do you do when your clergy person doesn't want to do anything? They use that as a protective thing, so they're sort of they're not accountable to the church that they serve, mm -hmm. and there's. Even throughout the whole there's no decent line management, if it was in the schools, they'd yeah. be shocking. Yeah. It would be absolutely shocking. Yeah. So there's no room for development. So someone who works really, really hard doesn't it, it doesn't yeah. get passed on, it doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. So why am I bothering? Mm-hmm. Do <laughs> a little key thing. But also it's sort of like they they say they're, they're protected, they don't have to do what their check want them to do because they're all day and fine. The bishop and therefore they're free to really do nothing. Yeah. And then they've got a church full of lay people who quite want to be developed and they've got the knowledge that would develop them but are not doing it. And yeah. thinking that's why the church is failing because yeah. the shift of power is in the wrong place. Yeah. And some of you are too not everyone, not everyone by any means, but some people are just too lazy to to do anything with their people. Mm -hmm. And it's just so sad to watch. Because the community doesn't even hear about the good message of Christ because it's all internalised <coughs> and it's just, yeah, it's just crazy. Well, you put your finger on exactly what I was trying to say about that problem um, and that's a really concrete way it can play out. Another concrete way it can play out is you impose a clergy person who's got a completely different churchmanship from the congregation and you wait for they all to leave. And then uh, These are not sensible things to do, uh, but you asked me a question, how do you deal with that? I think there's a quite simple answer to how you deal with that, and that is you, you um, bring into, ch into the Church of England the same standards that would govern the life of a public sector body like my university. So you have clear aligned management, you have 360 degree review where your whole congregation tell you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong every year, and you have freedom of information so people can find out about things and transparency and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The church shouldn't be working to a much lower moral standard than other public bodies. It should be a higher standard. And um, um, there are so many obvious ways of improving those sorts of things, so those awful situations don't happen. <laughs> An Ofsted report. That's a thought. <laughs> That's a thought. It doesn't take long to stay in a place right. That's a thought. But more, more of the sort of competition I was talking about. You've made me think of something else, which is that clergy often say rightly, I would love my lay people to be doing more, but they won't. I can't get them to. Um, there was a wonderful study of the Catholic, recently, a uh, couple of 20 years ago, um, of um, the Catholic Church in Britain. It was Birmingham Diocese, and um, uh, this guy went round and interviewed lots of clergy, Catholic clergy, and lots of parishes. And the clergy said, We'd love people to do more, but they won't. They might be really successful professionals, but when they come to church, they just become like children. 
Exactly, and that's what, that's what he concluded. You've infantilised lay people, so they're, they're too, yeah, so they act completely differently. They regress in church compared to outside of church. So it is, there's a big cultural problem, but we can't just shift it overnight. Thank you. Uh, more on this side, you've had a hand up for, for a while. Uh, Keith and John. When, when I was full time in the church, you wouldn't have had a talk like this without somewhere having quite a section on the parish system, as words you didn't use. Correct. And yet they sort of float around quite a lot of the discussion, mm. for example, staying in open priority areas and mm, things, mm, things mm. like that. Mm. Sometimes I think the Paris system is a, is a helpful myth or not very helpful myth. But I just wondered where, mm. how you see that with that picture of you know the church serve of there for everybody yeah. in its area, yeah. you know, and ministry serving that, and all of those things, which doesn't mm. always sit so easily with your diversity. Yes. More competitive. Yes, model. thank you. Thank you very much. And probably you've rumbled me, because the reason I didn't talk about it is because I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, it's a really tricky one. I feel really torn, because part of me loves the parish system, partly for reasons, some, some of the ones that Hannah mentioned, um, partly because I think connection to place is, is important, and those buildings. Um, but also, it, 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 it is a kind of idol. Um, and we, when we had a debate on it, a lot of clergy said, it doesn't exist anymore, what are you talking about? You know, we've got multiple benefices, parishes, the parish with a vicarage and a clergyman doesn't exist anymore, so it's kind of gone anyway. I did a big survey of Anglican clergy, and, at your, and I asked them, what, to you, what are the most valuable things about the Church of England? Guess what number one was? The parish system. <laughs> Community and the parish system. Just that last one. So I asked the clergy what was the most important, what do they think was the most valuable things about the Church of England? Number one, parish system. Number two, God. <laughs> 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 so there is something very deep there amongst clergy. When you ask lay, the lay people what's, what's the three most important things, parish system doesn't even figure. Or community. For them, it's Heritage, buildings, culture, and values. There are completely, again, it's this disjunction. Clergy have got a completely different. They think everyone values local community. Actually, they don't. Most people, you know, that community it doesn't matter to a lot of people anymore, not local community, because they have networked communities. Or, like me, I have enough of community and I want to break on Sunday. The last thing I want is community. <laughs> anyway, it's not a very good answer because I haven't got a very good answer. I kind of want the best of it, but not the worst of it, but I don't think you can get that. I just don't think you're right. Go on, <laughs> go on. I think the parish system has died. Right. And uh, nor, nor would our parish system have a new vicar consider anything else but our vicar. They wanted a vicar for them. Yes. And they happened to be a parish on their own with their own vicar. Yes. Um, and there are places still in the northwest of England where the parish system hasn't died. They'll probably write over the rest of the country, but well, they have died. Um, I work in many different areas of the country. Uh, but I don't think mm. even so it's died, even mm. when you've got four, as I've had, in Norfolk parishes, time and parishes, people are very committed to their community. Exactly, yes. And um, one, one of my questions, one of the four, which had not been answered, um, mm. <laughs> how would you pay for all these tiny, beautiful churches mm. um, with con congregations of maybe one or two, um, and, and, and communities that very, very few people in the um, who, who may or may not have mm. a, a, a connection, a, a, an emotional connection with the church. How do you keep these very expensive buildings going? And they are very expensive to keep going. Um, Thatch groups cost a great deal of money, they don't last all that long. Um, and, I mean, you did mention the Nordic tax system. Well, I mean, something like that might be necessary. But hmm. um, I don't know whether the National Trust model would ever actually apply to those kinds of churches. I mean, it might do. Hmm. Go to a time. It'd be nice to think that it could, but I'm not convinced that, that, that it could. Well, just take that, take that one. Yeah, um, I agree with you. That's why I'm quite positive about the parish system, because I think people love that local place and it's embedded in the history and it's really valuable so I don't want to get rid of that 
um, and it's an asset. And I also think the rural church is the strongest part of the Church of England. There are fewer declining churches, actually, in rural compared with urban areas. Let's not say it's strong, but it's less weak than the urban. There are fewer declining churches in rural areas, and there's more commitment and affection for the churches. And people are doing more imaginative forms of new ministry and partnership in rural areas, because um, they're having to. Uh, so um, the question is how you get people to pay for those expensive buildings, as you say. Um, I think somehow you have to open those buildings up to what they were in medieval times, i.e. a hub for the community. Uh, disastrously, people built village halls. You know, it should have been the nave, it should have been the church that was the place people did their real community and personal business in. Com village halls are such a shame because th that's where people should be meeting is in the church, but you've got village halls, so that's a problem. Uh, but I quite like the idea, you might have heard there's an idea from Exodus of festival churches where you, you say um, with rural churches, with tiny congregations, you, put them op you have trusts, you offer those buildings for people to bid to use them and you accept people who've got the most imaginative and lucrative ideas that will keep those buildings alive and you sign a trust deed with them, and the condition is that you, the church still performs the, the, the festivals, you know, the high holy days, and keeps them in, in that sense. The kind of partnership model. I think that's quite fruitful for many of them. But people do love those buildings, and they're wonderful, and you can make more of them, and there's just a bit of imagination needed. John, and then time for two more questions. Uh, you've uh, spoken about the disastrous dominance of paid clergy. How would you like to see the training of clergy develop? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I taught in a, in a theological residential college once, uh, which is a bit like a prep school. Uh, and that did infantilise all of us, actually. Um, uh, anyway, that's very expensive. So then there was the model of you know, people training in their local areas, and now there's the model of training on the job, because that's very cheap. Uh, and so there's a whole range of different ways at the moment, and no one knows quite what to do, and the diocese wants to control it, so it's a football, as you probably know. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Well, I was involved in training ordained local ministers to serve yeah. in their local areas. And we only accepted someone for training for ordination if they brought with them a team of lay people from their parish. And oh. they, they all trained together. And in some of the exercises the ordinary with the team would do a presentation to the congregation. The trouble was ministry division. They came to assess the ordinance. I said, no, you should be assessing the team, not the individual. They've got no idea of collaboration. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. I mean, there's, I, maybe there just needs to be some... It needs to be rethought. I don't know how. Um, but there needs to be some variety. I mean, some people need to be really well trained in theology. I think losing that because it's too expensive is a disaster. Because I did theology, so I love it. But it really matters. But not everyone needs... That. You know, so more diversity of skills and a more diverse training programme, perhaps. But I haven't got a sensible thought through answer on that one. But I like your example. That would solve a lot of problems. Um, to, just, just to check around, has anybody been waiting for ages to answer a question that I haven't seen? Uh, so, two more. One, go on, Open doors. Um, you, you made this comparison with the National Trust. Oh, yes. One of the happiest memories of my life is many, many years ago doing a tour around East Anglia and going from village to village to village to village, finding open doors <coughs> everywhere and seeing churches with magnificent monuments, with magnificent history. Nowadays, it seems it's not possible to do this. Mm. And I was interested really thinking within our church, which is actually a great one listed building and which we're only able to open for tiny slots of time outside our Sundays. Yeah. And you know, my dream would be to have a team of people to open it like a National Trust property yeah. and say, yeah. come and look. 
Yep. So that anybody who came at the moment, mm. if anyone comes to the church, they will see the phone number of our rector, say rector, who lives 15 miles away. Mm. And if they want to get in touch with anybody to open the place up, goodness knows what they would do. And so mm. they will come and they will read the two pages that we're, we're having a thousand great churches and still not be able to come to see our church. And yeah. that is true all over, rural Britain particularly, and yeah. in many places in the centre of great cities too. Mm. And it seems to me very sad that we can't achieve this. And I, I must say, I take home with me the thought of a, a National Trust church that would have yeah. the kind of volunteers they have in National Trust people who, who run this really. Yes on the cheap and you know, yes, completely. whether that's yes. a possibility for the church, but it's a dream. Yeah, maybe it is. I mean, we're all going to live to 125 or something, aren't we? So there'll be more people with more time on their hands. Yeah. Um, and um, it can only work if people are given real responsibility, I think. You know, you can't be doing a job for no pay for someone else and be messed around with. People have got to own those buildings. Uh, I was just this week, I uh, went to see a a very, very successful parish in Bromley by Bow in London, where he, the guy built it up from nothing in the 70s by just starting to do things in a very run-down area. And he said the only thing that, the reason this worked, it's now a huge community project and so on, was he, people would, he, he waited for the people who could do things. So, you know, a mother, a young mother came and said, oh, I'm good at cooking. So he said, well, you run the kitchen for a month. And he just connected the right people with the right skills and gave them, you're in charge of this. And then it just grows and snowballs. It's about reconnecting, that's what Fiona Reynolds said, reconnecting the right people with those buildings in the right ways. But you need people whose job it is to be getting that into shape. But the open doors thing is absolutely right. People need to be able to engage with the church and churches in the way they want. It might be incredibly minimal, like walking around the graveyard. You can't just expect people to plunge from nothing into regular <coughs> attendance. You need a whole range of ways of engaging, including just sitting quietly in a church with no one talking to you, which is what a lot of people want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it's all very well for you to talk about all these things, but generally speaking, certainly in Staffordshire, we are a declining in congregations in the churches because of age. Yeah. Now, uh, if we don't subscribe to the methods of Holy Trinity Bromson, how do we try and get the young people into the church? Because otherwise the churches will die because the parishioners will die out and nobody else will be interested. Well, yes and no. I mean, um, it, it's true that church decline becomes because children are less likely than their parents to go. But it's not the only way of changing things. So often I think the church ignores the people who are its most likely customers. You know, most businesses don't say, our only clients are young people. They look at who, is it women? What kind of women? Who's got time? Maybe old people. You know, they, I think you have to, you can't, churches tend to default to, if we haven't got young people, it's a disaster. But there can be other ways, and people might come at different stages of life, and for different reasons. So it's not always your, your, your total failure if you haven't got the young people. Uh, Linda, thank you very much. Can I just...